Shalom, Erev Tov, good evening from Jerusalem, Israel. This is Lowell Joseph Gallen, founder of the Root and Branch Association Limited, established in 1981 in New York State. We are now celebrating our 40th anniversary. I would like to welcome our viewers and listeners worldwide and our live Zoom studio audience to this evening's program in our Root and Branch Association Limited English Language Conference and Lecture Series broadcasting from Jerusalem, Israel. And now celebrating the start of our second quarter century. Having concluded our first quarter century from January 1995 until December 2020. I would like to express thanks to the Orthodox Union Israel Center for hosting our lecture series for 25 years, up until a year ago when everything was shut down because of our tragic worldwide situation. And special thanks to Educational Director Emeritus Phil Tranovsky of the Orthodox Union Israel Center for giving us a welcome home there for so long to launch our English language conference and lecture series. Now we are on Zoom. Today is Thursday, May 6, 2021 in the Gregorian calendar and the 24th day of ER 5781 in the Hebrew Israelite calendar. This is not a happy week for us in Israel and the world because we had the catastrophe at Moron, Lagba Omer, last, uh, well, actually it was very early Friday morning. I had hoped that would be a happy birthday party for me because this is the first time in many years that my Hebrew birthday, which is Lag Bomer, coincides with my English birthday, which is April 29th. And I went to sleep on Thursday, April 29th, thinking what a wonderful birthday until in the morning when I was sent out to Super Deal to get um, fresh baked pitot, the checkout lady said, uh, wow, that was a terrible tragedy, wasn't it? I thought, oh no, here we go, what is it now? And that was the first news I heard that at 1 a.m. in the morning, I think, a catastrophe had struck in Moron at the Lagba Omer uh, observances. And hopefully that will never happen again. We are broadcasting from the land of Israel, city of God, Jerusalem, hill of the priests, Ivat Hanania, Abu Tor, overlooking Mount Moriah, where the third and final Israelite temple of Jerusalem, we believe, will soon be under reconstruction and stand forever, as per the prophet Ezekiel's vision. Please see the biblical book of Ezekiel, chapters 40 through 48. Our speaker for this evening's program is old friend, Professor Asher Matathias, forgive my, me if I didn't pronounce it right, who is speaking about the Greek Jewry through the ages. And he is going to be introduced by old friend, Dr. Les Glassman. If you need your teeth fixed, fly into Jerusalem and go see Les, he's a dentist. And he will introduce, he's our program chair for the Root and Branch Association. And he will introduce Professor Matathias in a moment, and now I'm going to hand this over to Les. Thank you so much, Lau, and uh, wishing you a Yom Aledet Samer, a happy birthday, and may it just bring Mazel and Bracha. So, Lau, you mentioned um, about the terrible tragedy that happened in Mehran on Lagba Omer. Um, trying to take a little bit of a positive, if we can. Um, this is just a picture of um, a group in um, Kikar Rabin in Tel Aviv. We had Israelis from all different persuasions uh, mourning the loss of the 45 dear souls. And may the memories be for eternal blessings. And we're hearing stories from patients and friends of a lot of secular people coming to the religious homes, to the Shiva homes, to pour out their, their sympathy and condolences. And here we have religious people and secular people interacting and unified. So may may we know no more such sadness and there'll be a, a, 
a commission of inquiry, so this should not happen again. And uh, but we just hope and pray that the memories be for eternal blessing. Uh, it is a great honor and a privilege to introduce also a dear a friend that we've had many Zoom sessions with, and we look forward to very much meeting in Yerushalayim in Jerusalem one day soon. Uh, Professor Asha and Matthias, I hope I've also pronounced correctly. Um, Prof, you know, you've contributed so much to so many of our sessions, and it is indeed a tremendous honor and a privilege to have you tonight. So I'm just going to just briefly give a bit of your CV, which is so impressive, and we really could spend um, maybe the whole program just discussing your incredible achievements, but we are anticipating your, your um, presentation tonight with great eagerness. So, Prof, you were born uh, in December the 3rd, 1943, it was during the Second World War. But you were born on a mountain cave outside Volos in Greece, while hiding from the Nazis. Your family members very sadly perished in Salonika, uh, as did so many in the uh, famed Sephardic community. But Baruch Hashem, you survived. And you arrived with family in New York City on January 30th, 1956, aboard the USS Constitution, uh, victims of shattered earthquakes also. In few 55 years, you've been involved in various levels of public and private education. Now a uh, professor emeritus, uh, assistant professor, you're the only Greek American immigrant survivor of the Holocaust of Greek Jewry to be nominated for the Republican and the Liberal candidate for the um, Sembosman in New York State, and that was in 1974. You're a fre frequent public speaker, and you write uh, on uh, local and national and international topics. Um, you're involved with the Holocaust Memorial and to Tolerance Center in Glen Cove community, and um, you're also uh, a participant in Lawrence Beth Shalom Cantorial Choir, you're the president of the Five Towns B'nai Brit Lodge, and I think most important, you're married to Anna, and you've been married since August the 29th, 1970, after a 13 day courtship. Well, mine was three weeks, yours is 13 days, which is incredible. You're the father of three daughters and the grandfather of seven grandchildren, Kane and Horan. So it is a tremendous honor and a privilege to introduce our esteemed guests for this evening. And I hand over to you, Prof, and we look forward in great anticipation. Thank you. Thank you, Les. Uh, and again, my condolences on your mother's recent past. And thank you, uh, and Mazel Tov to Arie on your very important uh, birthday. Uh, and my father, may rest in peace, uh, will quell just to think that uh, there are people who pronounce the name properly, Matathias, because in Greek there is no I. It was here that the Matathias, uh, I have come to hear the name called Marathias because of the I. Uh, and I thank you very, very much. Uh, for that uh, uh, consideration. And congratulations on the 40th uh, anniversary of the uh, Root and Branch Association. Uh, and I counted 22 days, 22 topics, 22 speakers addressing this uh, semester, the range of socio-political and cultural concerns to stimulate a virtual worldwide audience. And I also congratulate you on the publication of the Quran Code uh, and that bridges the gap uh, between Muslims and Jews. And may you have success in that. It is my happy augury to attempt to uh, advance understanding and appreciation of Greek Jews through the ages. The very mention of which, of whom, is oxymoronic for some people while proposing specific steps uh, to, uh, re to uh, reconstituted modern alas after two centuries of wanted neglect and official persecution that it, it must immediately take to lift the 
burden of being a Greek Jew. Two millennia from the appearance of Jews in ancient Greece, the Romans pursued a sophisticated plan to extinguish Judaism via the stratagem of creating a diaspora through conditions of absorption, assimilation, conversion, landlessness in a sea of subject populations preceding the arrival of Christianity, sane and decent people must inexorably conclude from this discussion that Greek Jewish lives matter after all. A word of, uh, about how I came to, the, to, this, to receive this uh, uh, request that I could not refuse. I was invited by a mutual friend, Dr. Yitzhak Kerem, to attend his own enriching lecture on the fraud subject of Eskenazi and Sephardi relations, less so as time marches on. Fraud and the even less existence within Greek society of the minimalist segment of Jews between Romagnot, Greek speakers, and the much reduce Ladino speakers. Yitzhak, born Eskenazi, is an eminent scholar at the Hebrew University, editor of Sephardi Hamizdrak newsletter since 1991, unsparing in promoting the equity of Holocaust reparations to Sephardi victims, and most recently scoring a coup of conscience as the Israeli government decided to end the protracted scandal resulting from the abduction and disappearance under false pretenses of Yemenite Jewish immigrant children to distribute for profit to childless Jewish couples in North America. He's also a commentator on the Greek, uh, uh, the late Greek scholar, Rachel, Dr. Rachel Darwin, a translator of Greek poetry, a playwright on the history of the Jews of Ioannina, Greece. She was a dear friend and a distant relative of ours who stayed in our home to share Shabbat with my family and worship at the Safari Temple in Syrahurst. Instead of giving you a linear historical development of Greco-Jewish relations, it would be more compelling to see so between the fog of the distant past and the equally disheartening contemporary landscape, replete with regular delirious outpourings of anti-Semitism, now even made a not uncommon in our own United States of America, the Western and undeveloped world, and but it's most pronounced in my native land. The American Jewish Committee's two, 2019 survey of American Jews found that anti-Semitism is for 38% a very serious problem. 43% believe it has increased a lot over the past five years compared to a year ago. 42% think the status of Jews in the United States is less secure. 62% strongly disapproved of former President Trump's handling of the threat of antisemitism. 76% viewed unfavorably how President Trump was handling his job. 73% said that the statement American Jews are more loyal to Israel than, Israel, than America is anti-Semitic. 86% 80% consider anti-Semitic the assertion that the United States government only supports Israel for the Jewish money. 84% view that the statement, Israel has no right to exist as anti-Semitic. 49% believe the extreme political right presents an, uh, an anti-Semitic threat. However, 95% say, they haven't avoided visiting Jewish institutions or not participating in Jewish events because that would be that they would feel unsafe there. In similar vein, the Anti-Defamation League of Renee Brith in its Global Index 100 survey assigns a 67% anti-Semitic attitude to Greeks, scoring the highest affliction of this social virus in the world outside the Middle East. Specifically, 60% of the Greek population believes that Jews are more loyal to Israel than any other country in which they live. They think that 80% of Jews have too much power in the business world. 
60% of Jews still think, talk too much about the Holocaust. 53% of Greeks believe that Jews don't care what happens to anyone but their own kind. 74% of the population of Greece believes Jews have too much control of global affairs. 69% of Greeks perceive Jews have too much control over the U.S. government. 42% of Greeks think that Jews believe they are better than anybody else. And 68% of, of Greeks believe that Jews have too much control over the global media. Extrapolating such statistics backwards, let's reflect on the just completed quote unquote celebration of this bicentennial of the March 25th, 1821 uprising against the nearly 400 year yoke of Ottoman Turkish rule. Mindful that our people is the first expression of self-rule in the exodus from ancient Egypt with the direct intervention of the omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, the heroes of the Greek revolution arrange the divine inter intercession in conveniently selecting the Christian Orthodox Feast of Annunciation to occur at the time of the commencement of the uprising. Conspic conspicuous by its absence was any mention in official proceedings of the darkest chapter of the war for Greek independence. The fear for the, for the main battles of liberation was the Peloponnese, the most southern peninsula of the most forbidding mountainous terrain, also known as Moria. That strategic advantage was exploited by the Greeks to the hilt, savagely slaughtering the Turks in every direction and opportunity, while doing the same thing to the Jews, 5,000 of them. The human penchant to extract revenge, a pent up hatred suppressed for so long in Greek bosoms was also targeted to the Jewish minority who were evaluated to be insufficiently enthralled with the prospect of changing allegiances. In the wake, the region became Judenrein, 110 years before the Nazi Germans attempted the same thing. Today, I cry, today, no Jew lives south of Corinth. No Jew. New York mega businessman John Katsimatidis, owner of WABC AM radio, uh, requested my input on the occasion of the 25th of, of the 200th anniversary. And I appear uh, uh, between a federal judge and I was followed by the US Senator uh, uh, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer to string along personal vignettes Compress into three minutes of, or more, very few minutes of airtime, I managed to assert several upbeat points amplified in the subsequent written addendum. First, the Greek Revolution was not unique. It was part of a continuum of people's search for self-determination that began in 1776 in America, 1789 in France, 1811 in, in Mexico, and the rest of South America. Democracy as a concept was short-lived in slave-owning ancient Athens, more hailed as an aspiration in the 200 years of modern Elas than actually implemented. Assassination, dictatorship, monarchy have been even more common with the current application of popular rule the longest since toppling of the colonels in the in, in 19, the Colonel's Junta in 1974. Three, conspicuous in the emerging, is the emerging profile of the Greek American Jew, Dr. Albertus Bourlas, CEO of Pfizer Pharmaceuticals and the producer distributor of his company's entry into the market of vaccines that will mitigate, if not totally eradicate the COVID-19 pandemic. Four, the, ma the mayor of Ioannina is Dr. Moises Elisaf, El El Elisaf, 
the first Romagnol Jew to be elected to the highest post in a Greek city. Five, the legacy of the former twice elected mayor of Salonika, Yanis Butaris, lives on in the exemplary tenure that made him a Jewish favorite for his incomparable sympathetic sensitivity to laws of this once dominant population, 87% of whom was exterminated in the concentration camps in Poland. In his second inauguration, Butaris, Mayor Butaris donned the Magen David, the yellow Magen David, provoking outrage from the representatives of the neo-Nazi Golden Dawn Party. Before leaving office, he initiated plans to erect a Holocaust Memorial and Educational Center in Salonika, a project stalled in characteristic Greek bureaucratic turf struggles. Finally, six, the, okay, the day ended on a high note with the President of Israel sending a congratulatory note uh, Ruben Rivlin to the Greek uh, government. Nor did I overlook the attention it deserves a little known detail to the annals of, decent, of recent geopolitical history. The blood that was recorded and persists on November 29, 1947 in post-war Greek diplomacy. The venue was the reconstituted United Nations General Assembly whose members gathered to debate and decide the fate of the British mandate on Palestine. In an outcome that would do King Solomon proud, a 33 nation majority proposed the quintessential two-state solution that continues to bedevil the world's attention to this day. In that ancient land called Canaan, Judea, Palestine would be carved two new nations, one Arab and the other Herzl's dream of a modern Zion, fulfilling an earlier promise made by President Woodrow Wilson in his 14 points for national self-determination. 10 nations abstained and 13 others, mainly Arab and Muslim, voted against the birth of a Jewish state. In a rare show of solidarity, expounding modern anti-Semitism as anti Zionism, mutual regional antagonists, Greece and Turkey, were among the naysayers. Nearly four years ago, as the 70th anniversary of this insidious ballot was nearing, a petition of conscience, there's the petition of conscience that was circulated in 10 nations, uh, received endorsement in 10 nations, including Greek nationals and expatriates, unanimously state that Greece as the only European and Christian country then voting in the negative, recant, repudiate that vote. Then in an expression of sincere regret, apologize to Israel and the entire Jewish people. The case for precisely such overdue corrective action was featured in another broadcast uh, uh, where, where I appear with John Katsimatidis. Thus shall the stain of Greece's vaunted Philotimo, this reputation it has for Bessa, for decency, for empathy, for kindness, will be redeemed, along with a self-evident demonstration of Christian love. The mention of Greece's neighbor, a Muslim nation, is to early underscore that all 200 Jews of Albania and a few more who were born during the, uh, the occupation uh, were saved in the Holocaust. 55,000 Greek Jews perished. Our petition remains an orphan, spurned by the Greek government, the church, hierarchy, the press, and Hellenic organized civil society on both sides of the Atlantic. It's instructive to note that our own great republic belatedly but comprehensively admitted to giving in to the hysteria of anti-Japanese sentiment in the aftermath of the Pearl Harbor attack. 
that that defined and and we know in an order that defied the the his reincarnation as the future trailblazing chief justice of the supreme court california then california governor earl warren endorsed executive order 9066 signed by the great president fdr for the wholesale removal and relocation of japanese americans to south central states for the war's duration decades later in a bipartisan fashion president reagan raised our country's standing in the world by admitting the gross error in doubting the loyalty of our compatriots issuing even twenty thousand dollar checks tax-free to the survivors south africa instituted a truth and reconciliation commission in order to confront the ravages of apartheid bringing victims and their tormentors face to face to better seek an acceptable modus vivendi uh, among the races living side by side such panels can play a useful role in greece as that society delves into the abyss in order to confront the deep-seated animus operating in greco-jewish relations and the emerging second reconstruction in the united states for our blessed american polity to fulfill the promises of the original plan aborted in the wake of the corrupt bargain that settled the election of 1876. yet consider how blessed we are to witness the possibilities ahead how thrilling it is that a biden cabinet of rivals and many minorities Jews of conspicuous attainment and competence are prominent enough to contemplate minyanim, prayer uh, gatherings in the Oval Office. Consider, for example, that uh, uh, we have the first Native American, Deb have, uh, Hallen, to head the Department of Interior, the first openly gay man, former Mayor Pete Buttigieg, to head the Department of Transportation. Indeed, America continues its march towards more inclusiveness, one that would have, we would have to invent it if it were not facing us. The ambivalence felt by my dear erstwhile compatriots, I often must remind Greeks in Greece and in the United States that one cannot forsake the motherland where I was given formative intellectual shape my criticism is rendered lovingly and in disappointment always hoping that the next turn will bring long for permanent changes their attitude towards jews is embedded and is determined by the confluence of pagan classical greece with the strict monotheism of post mosaic israel the story of hanukkah is one that is very instructive for I frequently am uh, uh, on uh, Greek radio, and they told me by saying, all right, professor, are you for the Greeks or are you for the Jews? Of course, we know that uh, Antiochus Epiphanes was not Greek, but a descendant of general of the staff Alexander the Great. His want to sacrilege was to install a statue of Zeus and sacrifice a pig in the temple to impose what was then known as the first attempt at Hellenization. The, steering, the steerings of revolt were inevitable, and the Maccabees, whose leader is resisting this de desecration of Hashem, after all, was a Marathias, and he was able to assert their sovereignty, cleansing the temple, sanctifying it with pure oil that lasted eight days. More terrible hardships were yet to appear for their success was temporary. The earliest contacts of Jews in Greece's territorial waters include gravestone circa, circa 325 CE outside of Volos in Angelos and a mosaic on the floor of a synagogue in the island of Delos. Thus interaction with Greek philosophers was probable, though no form of Platonic or Aristotelian dialogues exist with the people of the book. What is amply illustrated is the journey of the apostate 
Jew born Saul on the road to Damascus, possessed of a vision, rhetorically asking him why he has such animus towards Christians and the good news, he becomes the apostle Paul and begins to proselytize his travels, finding him all over the then known world. Now born again, the apostle inevitably visits Salonika synagogue to make his speech for a new covenant to a pensive congregation. The fisherman's horn message, tailored as Jewish light, was designed to catch a white catchman of souls. Thus, the strictures of totally of daily Jewish living, circumcision, kashrut, were promptly eliminated. And Sunday, originally the day of the sun god, was substituted for Shabbat, the day of rest. The last was decreed by the still pagan Emperor Constantine I, soon to get notoriety as the persecuting head of the Eastern Roman Empire, headquartered in his eponymous uh, city, and promulgating after his own conversion, Christianity as the official state religion. From its founding in 330 CE until its sacking by the Ottoman Turks in 1453, the Byzantine Empire was relentless disaster for Jews. Particularly dra dramatic was the assault on Constantinople and other communities by the Crusaders on the way to liberate the Holy Land from the conquering Muslims. The tome, Constantine's sword, by the lapsed priest James Carroll, eh, explains in graphic detail the enormity of the early crimes amassed by a self-describing faith dedicated to turning the other cheek, forgiveness, and love. Even a casual survey of history and how the junior monotheistic religions treated the senior founders of one God, the jury long ago returned a verdict that Islam, even in its appeal to ignorant tribes of the desert, treated Jews better than the adherents of the Prince of Peace. Byzantium became the seat of the Eastern Orthodoxy, removed from such future incubating movements for reform and progress as the Renaissance, the Protestant Reformation and the Enlightenment, all materially enhancing the liberation of Western societies from stifling oppressive suppressions of thought. However, the Apostle Paul was put off by his core religious silence and rejection of his appeal, and he became the archetypical anti-Semite, the personification of that. Indeed, in time and in places as diverse as the Arabian desert and Wittenberg in the European heartland, the prophet Muhammad and the theologian uh, uh, and the theologian Martin Luther respectively would promote their own versions of divine epiphany. First, lob, 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 lobbying Jews, ultimately turning on them for being stiff-necked people, as even Moses called his Hebrews, who faithfully continued their allegiance to the assigned patrimony of the patriarchs Abraham Isaac and Jacob. For Jews living in, with distinctions in dress and reserve areas, the ghetto was introduced in Venice in 1516 and spread across to Rome, Prague, Frankfurt, and Byzantium, where uh, Jews, Armenians, Ismailites, Hagarites, and others were explicitly required to live apart, pursuing silk weaving, cloth dyeing while stressing education and the solidarity that communal identification provides. They will form the genesis of the Romaniot Jews found in Romania and settling south in Europe's southeastern appendage, that is Greece. Jewish history takes a dramatic turn with the political and marital union of King Ferdinand of Aragon and Queen Isabella of Castile promulgating the Spanish Inquisition in 1478. By 1492 uh, was the year that uh, uh, both the, con the conquest of Granada from the Moors and the Alhambra 
uh, edict of expulsion. It was formally and symbolically revoked on December 16, 1968, following the Second Vatican Council. In the event, Jews were offered a veritable Hobson choice, convert or be expelled from the Iberian Peninsula. Portugal would follow uh, suit a few years later. Those choosing to emigrate moved north to France, as did my wife's ancestors. Italy, the Balkans, North Africa, and the Middle East, areas coming under the suzerainty of the dominant Ottomans. My mom, Nina, of blessed memory, was the descendant of the famous Jewish community of Salonika, whose numbers mushroomed to, con uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, convert, to convert it into the Madre de Israel for the vibrant intellectual environment that will soon bring a myriad of blessings. The Ottoman Sultan, Bayezid II, having sent his navy to evacuate the Jews to safety in his vast empire, gave orders that they must be welcome and become his honored citizens. Further, he hardly joked the behavior of the Spanish monarchs in expelling such useful subjects as the Jews, stating derisively, you venture to call Ferdinand a wise ruler. He who has impoverished his own country and enriched mine. History amply relates that no nation has prospered that has persecuted Jews. Conversely, all countries have benefited from their presence, none more so than the United States of America. While Jewish culture thrived under the Ottoman Turks and their conspicuous contributions recognized, even in the royal court, as another class of the Dimi, non-Muslim population, Jews were obliged to pay extra taxes, wear special clothing, banned from carrying guns, riding horses, or publicly demonstrating their religion. One may say this soft, petty anti-Semitism did not match the popular stereotype of the Jew in Western literature, you know, the Shylock. And the most viral aspect in the case of French uh, Captain Alfred Dreyfus. He was accused of betraying his country, wrongfully convicted, spending a stint in Devil's Island before being exonerated. Such noteworthy series of events made the non Jewish author Emile Zola famous through his Jacques, exposing the miscarriage of justice, and the assimilated Jew. Theodore Herzl to be aroused to envision a latter day homeland for world Jewry in ancient Israel, then Palestine and controlled by the Ottomans via the vehicle of Zionism. World War I was preceded by the convulsive 1912 1913 Balkan Wars, with protagonists, the all antagonists, Greece and Turkey, the latter called the sick man of Europe. With the involvement and consent of the big powers, territorial adjustments added part of Macedonia to Greece, which included the geo espanol speaking Sephardic Jewish majority, which had settled in Salonika. The tears shed by Jews to witness such a transfer of sovereignty would prompt Greek leader Eleftherios Venizelos to point to an alleged but non existent disloyalty. This lament encapsulates the sentiment of loss. Amen. <laughs> My lost happiness for the first time in, in my life is empty, meaningless, for you have left my golden light and I am without your caresses. I cannot live for another to love. Where would I find such a treasure of love? A Ladino Spanish refrain wails for a departed beloved and, in, and a life no more wanted. 
Adio, adio, querida, no quiero la vida, me la magrates tu. A consequence of the of this period resonating with contemporary meaning was the issuing of the Balfour Declaration, November 2, 1917, referring to the British mandate thusly. His Majesty his government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. The advent spark added excitement fueling the expectation for a messianic redemption of a people long maligned, persecuted, even killed with impunity. The 1917 catastrophic incineration of Salonika's wooden structures representing an early nail on the coffin of declining fortunes for a once thriving Jewish community. The Jewish National Fund's blue box was a feature in my home and in other Greek Jewish homes, presaging a new epoch. Meanwhile, America's Roaring Twenties ended the, uh, in a universal economic depression, felt personally by the high-end Salonika re re restaurateur Daniel Atun and his family of a wife, Rachel, and children Nina, Mehdi, and the brothers Shabbatai and Jake. That was my mother's family. The 1930s saw Greece plunge in its usual socioeconomic political instability, bring forth the country's own fascist regime under General Ioannis Metaxas. His 15 minutes of fame came in the morning of October 28, 1940, responding with the resounding Ohi rejecting Italy's ultimatum to have Benito Mussolini's troops march and occupy the country. Greek armed forces, undermanned and under-equipped, defended and even expanded the country's control into southern Albania. In the campaign, a heroic Greek Jew, Colonel Mordechai Frizis, fell from his white horse while leading his troops at the front early in the struggle. In the opening scene of what would become a transformative Second World War, 13,000 Greek Jews were drafted or enlisted. 3,500 returned, mainly amputees to injuries and frostbite, with 513 losing their lives. In 2010, 2010, finally, Greece belatedly in everything concerning Jews, and in the presence of the then president, Carlos Papoulos, dedicated a statue in, his in this military hero's hometown of Halkis. There is a tragic dimension to this drama that never fails to bring forth my own tears. At the time of Italy's invasion, my father's younger brother, Asher, lived and worked in Larissa with Italian planes buzzing he headed for nearby raid shelter, leaving behind his best friend, my future father-in-law, Moshe Frances, to complete a typing document. While crossing the square, a bomb fell squarely on his head, killing him instantly. Upon my birth three years later, my destined name, as firstborn to be my grandfather's Samuel became Asher. To memorialize and honor this relative, I never had the opportunity to know. Years later, at my own bar mitzvah loom in our family's first year in America, I was assigned the Torah portion containing the individual, uh, individually designated design blessings given to his 12 sons uh, by the patriarch Jacob. Feverishly, I began anxiously, perhaps in terror, to turn the pages to discover the character of the prototypical Asher. Oh, how I was relieved and thrilled to learn that he was said to be of happy disposition and on the road to material fortune. 
while I manifestly am the former, I continue to aspire to the latter. For batting 500 is admirable in any team of baseball. The teen bar mitzvah celebration was postponed for 50 years. My bar mitzvah was postponed. For my younger sibling, Miriam, became a leukemia victim a few days before the event in 1956. Finally, it was held at my mother's urging when I was 63. He said, you know, uh, you're entitled uh, second bar mitzvah when you're 83, but I may not be around, so let's do it now. Our own first child was similarly named for my late sister instead of Sarah, my mom, who nevertheless was given her name as our third daughter was born. In the midst of a brutal war that would claim 50 million lives, and as a final solution to the Jewish problem was being concocted, a couple fell in love. A Romagnot, the maiden of Sephardi beauty, whose Salonic parents imposed a condition for marriage, that the young Suda, who was uh, a Romagnot, should become versed in Ladino, for they still did not speak Greek uh, fluently. They married on September 6, 1942, months before the Austrian future United Nations Secretary General Kurt Warheim, then an obedient, willing collaborator in Hitler's demonic plan, would help ship Salonika's Jews, including four members of the aforementioned Atun family, to Auschwitz Birkenau. To be sure, there were Greeks who amply deserve honorable mention, conspicuously putting themselves and their families in jeopardy. A proposition I and my students cannot. Uh, be certain we would or can duplicate, for we live in a, a, a enveloped in the security and a constitutionally protected nation. Alas, our American experience on January 6th threatens to undermine our government's best intentions that it operates by and for the people. After all, democracy is fragile. And without self restraint and respect for the institutional guardrails, can quickly devolve into a dictatorship. The pantheon of Greeks acting with courage, uncommon courage, during the period of existential challenge for Jews does not expand through repetition, but needs to be again mentioned. Police Chief Evangelos Sever, Archbishop Damaskinos, Mayor Lucas Carrer, Bishop Christos, uh, Chrysostomos, Metropolitan Joachim, Chief Rabbi Moshe Pesach, Froso and Yorgo Stamos, our families' saviors. Even the kindly disposed German consul, Helmut Scheffel. I have the book written by my friend, Dimitris uh, Benekos. It's a bilingual book in German and, and Greek about this wonderful man. Uh, the last Warn of imminent danger and the need to disperse the in mountainous hiding places where I was born, as uh, Les said, December 3rd, 1943. Further, Professor ben Benekos has written this bilingual biography. My, our everlasting regret remains that there was a dearth of such kindness to overcome simmering long-standing anti-Semitism, making too many others, sometimes unwittingly, Hitler's willing executioners. The title of a comprehensive study by Professor Daniel Goldhagen. Wartime experience laid open deep social divisions in Greek society, especially between monarchists and the emerging force of communist appeal as many became enamored with promises for a worker's paradise and equality of opportunity, enticing many more to enlist vigorously in the resistance, including some Jews. The ensuing Greek civil war would last an additional four years after 1945 and would have my father drafted, seeing service as, as an assistant to a major and in 
and insisting that his young family reside on base to secure food. The scholar Leon Satier refer, refers in depressing detail the machinations involving the German occupying authorities and Greek municipal administrators in expropriating the historic Salonica Jewish cemetery using the gravestone as building material for a new Aristotle University and the ornamental use in private homes and churches. Can you imagine this? The sacrilege continues in current report, reported attacks on Jewish burial grounds, Holocaust memorials, and synagogues. Having mentioned the singularly despicable position of Greeks of Greece among Christian and European nations in, 19, in the 1947 vote to dispose British Palestine and despite my neighbor lands, Israel, uh, uh, lands support, Israel was indeed uh, born in May 14, 1948, receiving the grudging de facto recognition under Konstantinos Mitsotakis, the father of Kyriakos, today's Prime Minister, the current Greek Premier in 1990, the country upgraded the status with the Jewish state to de jure, full diplomatic ties, the last member of the then 12th member European community to do so. Fast forward to the United Nations Resolution 3379, adopted November 10, uh, 1975, by a vote of 7235 with 32 abstentions including that of Greece. It was determined that Zionism equals racism, a profound ignorance of the concept which seeks the establishment and security of a Jewish homeland. So much for a Hellenic non-existent profile and courage. The stain in the international body's reputation was removed December 16, 1991, rescinding the 15-year-old expression of hostility 111 to 25 with 13 abstention. This time, modern Elas temporarily shed its prejudice, voting in favor of resolution 46 slash 86 to withdraw the General Assembly's misguided decision. One is hardened by other positive signs that warms the hearts of those who wish better Greco Jewish relations. Inside the country, with its meager population of 5,000 remaining Jews, bilaterally with, the, with Israel, even three way with the United States, military, economic, and political cooperation is high. And the neo Nazi Golden Dawn Party, while nominally counted among the three or four powerful political units, remains marginalized by mainstream Greeks. Greeks. Then there is the welcoming, brilliant initiative taken on December 5, 2011 by Archbishop Chrysostomus II of Cyprus and then Ashkenazi Chief Rabbi Yona Metzger of Israel in a proclamation that has yet to be replicated by the Orthodox hierarchy in America, uh, Athens and in Istanbul, certainly inconceivable in Russia, but possible in Bulgaria, it commits the partners to enhance bilateral relations. That has been accomplished through the first ever admission by the Cyprus Christian Orthodox Church that it's baseless to maintain Jewish responsibility for the crucifixion. Thus, a progressive Christian leader referred to the sainted Pope John XXIII's retirement of this libel, slander, endorsed by the Second Vatican Council in Austria, Artate, in 1965, serving as a model and the basis to eradicate European religious antisemitism. In the declaration, I gladly learn and acknowledge that the Cyprus Church never participated in the charges of a comprehensive responsibility of the Jews in the crucifixion or in the systematic denial of Judaism. For his part, and in the Jerusalem Post, Chief Rabbi Metzger states, today we have inscribed a historic proclamation pertaining to the relations of Jew Judaism and this Orthodox Church. 
Until now, Orthodox churches were unwilling to undertake such initiatives. Still, the Cyprus church, with today's proclamation, assumes such responsibility. We now hope through stages we will be able to develop initiative, uh, relative contacts and relations with other Orthodox churches, the Greek and Russian among them. More, the Declaration affirms the teachings of Judaism and Christianity relative with life, life's sanctity. And this connection mentions, quote, we condemn every action that desecrates such holiness, especially acts of bias and terror against the innocent, and especially when such conduct involves the sacrilege of God and religion. Though, uh, though way past time, let us encourage Nicosia to approach Greek com com uh, counterparts, urging that superstition be superseded by reason enough to permit the proper and favorable, uh, favorable resolution of twin unfulfilled missions. The aforementioned, I'm almost finished. The aforementioned ecclesiastical authorities must sim similarly alter their well unorthodox, even anachronistic uh, dogma that my people are guilty of DSI. In light of the recent Orthodox Easter, to also preach to their parishes the cessation of the pagan practice of burning Judas in effigy to, to arouse their people. And finally, have the Greek government wash the stain that exists in its diplomatic annals for more than 73 years in Resolution 181. It is comfort, it's comforting, it's comforting uh, to get this recent message from a rabbi in Jerusalem. Dear Asher, by Israel, you are such a passionate person. It's inspiring. Hashem should bless you for your sincere dedication to your people. Behavod, Uvraha. This inexhaustive topic comes to a still inconclusive result. A glorious Jewish past points to an uncertain future in Greece. Following this nostalgic look back, which jars the senses, perhaps foreshadowing a terminal eclipse. God forbid, a resurgence of Jewish life in modern Elas is not achieved without official government and religious affirmative action to protect, preserve, and perpetuate Greek Jews. This has been the repeated subterranean message in all that has been said in great detail. To institutionally assure such de desirable outcomes, there must be acceptance of this systematic, systemic, generational racism within Greek polity before matters, matters are set straight. And paneling a Hellenic Truth and Conciliation Commission will probe the yet unexplored ancient social disease of antisemitism. Why, how self-evident methodologies to eradicate it. Such welcome and stinting penetration of the collective Greek psyche will inevitably expose other untreated ailments, apart from faith-associated prejudice to extricate the remnants of unnecessary, objectionable, even loathsome Ottoman, Ottoman Turkish practices grafted into Greek society in 400 years of subjugation. Let the major mainstream political parties assiduously seek representatives from the Jewish community, grooming them for the high profile offices of government, commensurate with their above average education, experience in organization, communal and international. The Hellenic parliament must become more reflective of the diverse population it governs. Holocaust studies must be comprehensively enacted in all levels of education within the country and in all expatriate communities around the world. The journey premium took to the annual 
march of the living should become ordinary, not the exception, by the normal participation of a swath of young and younger Greeks to raise their sensibilities. The vocabulary, both official and of the its citizenry, must radically change. In my major trip to Athens in 1970, following a family's departure from Piraeus in 1956, and as our TWA was descending in Elinikon Airport, my heart skipped a beat as I observed the welcoming slogan emblazoned on the immaculately groomed grass. It said, Alas, Elinon Christianon, Greece for Greek Christians. Of course, I was fully aware that a nativist junta of colonels had overthrown an elected, an elected government in 1967. But the exclusivity expressed in those sentiments are abominable, even as they are widely shared by all manner of Greeks today and are regularly intoned in public events as the recent bicentennial of the Greek Revolution. As it has been said, often by me in reference to America during the benighted administration of the 45th president greece is and must be better than this let us forge a new coexistence of mutual enrichment and imagination perhaps a minority no longer besieged amid the need to protect in order to perpetuate it's the only way to live for each other so that we can live with ourselves. And please join me with Gusta to sing. O tire, o tire, kamato ye ye, bashana, bashana, abba. If we care, wait and see, wait and see what a world they can be. If we care, if we share, you and me. Really, it is a beautiful world. I hear babies crying. I watch them grow. They'll learn, 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 learn much more than I'll ever know. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Yes, I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Oh, yeah. Thank you very, very much. Oh, thank you so very much for your passionate and your incredible presentation. And um, that really was in something extraordinary. Thank you. And it came from your heart and we, we really you. very grateful. Thank you. I'm going to open the floor if uh, anybody wants to make a comment or ask a question. So, okay, so I, while people are thinking about uh, the, the questions, I want to show something actually quite nice. This is um, a souvenir leaf of a joint stamp uh, yes. that was issued on the 25 years of the diplomatic relations between Israel and Greece. And um, you have a Greek uh, stamp that's from uh, Thessalonica, from Salonica, and uh, depicting the port and the Israeli stamps from Kaifa. And Prof, if you could just discuss a little bit about uh, the stevedores that actually went to Kaifa. They were from the Zionist um, organization before the State of Israel. They came to uh, Salonika and they said, please, we're establishing our own state. We need you for um, to come to Kaifa to be part of the reestablishment of the state of, uh, for the Jewish state. And many did come, and they stayed in, in, in Haifa, and that increased the Greek culture in, in Israel, and it saved their lives. Because I think, and I'm sure this is very well known, that uh, Salonika, the port was actually closed on Shabbat, as most of the workers were, were Jewish. That's right. So it was a very Jewish city, and it had a tremendous Jewish flavor in it. And when I was there before the COVID, about a year and a half ago, 
it's actually devoid of Jews today. They're very, there's a handful of Jews living in Salonika, which is, it's, it's actually in Thessalonica. So if you could just uh, enlighten our listeners on um, how Greek stevedores and Greek port workers actually came to Haifa and established a Greek community. There was wonderful. one in Chul Moshe today, uh, in 1935, uh, knowing the, uh, or detecting from the uh, dark clouds that are, were emerging in Europe, the, uh, the unhappy future, a group of Castoria Jews uh, en masse left to go to Palestine and found in Drod, Natanya, a moshav called Chur Moshe. Years later, uh, we visited, uh, and they speak uh, Greek and Ladino, uh, and it was uh, uh, heartwarming. Uh, two of, of the families in, um, in uh, the Safari Temple, the Hazan uh, family, uh, help support it, and uh, the Zakaria family. They are also uh, from Castoria. So uh, it is uh, something that uh, continues to uh, connect us, just as the uh, remnants, the descendants of the Zakynthos community uh, return, who uh, after the war, uh, not only were they saved, but they emigrated to Israel, they still return to pay homage to the uh, people of that island. Again, always, 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 not enough, not enough uh, in, in, in terms of uh, the, the final result in, in, in uh, being saved. 95% of the Danish Jews were saved. You know, it's no coincidence. They, were fe they felt themselves to be part of the nation. The king rode around in his horse uh, identifying with his uh, Danish uh, subjects uh, who were Jewish. Unfortunately, that is not the case. And I, in my humble effort to get them to do the decent thing, it, it doesn't, uh, we don't want compensation from the Greek government to admit that this was a, an abysmal miscarriage of uh, diplomatic justice to vote against the creation of the Jewish state. And secondly, I, I appeal to the hierarchy of, of the church to get rid of this. They would feel so elated, so unburdened by getting rid of this uh, heavy burden called uh, the dogma of uh, collective uh, guilt for the crucifixion. The only major religious uh, uh, denomination that continues to perpetuate this. This is my passport picture. This is my father, a few years after liberation, walking along Volos. This is me with the gymnasium uh, uh, cap that I thought I would bring to America, uh, thinking that I will continue to use it here. And that's the boat, the freighter, that took us from Piraeus to Brindisi on the first leg. Uh, in those days, uh, uh, Piraeus was not deep enough uh, of a port to accommodate ocean liners. So we went to Brindisi, then we crossed the Italian boot uh, by uh, train, and waited in Naples for three days for the Constitution to arrive. This is my, uh, my maternal grandfather, a very aristocratic uh, fellow, and my parents at their engagement in 1942, shortly before being married. This is where we lived for about six months intense after the, the mid-1950s um, uh, earthquakes. You see my mother and my sister, Rochelle, who now lives in California. These are uh, the three siblings. This is uh, my brother, Dr. Daniel Marathias, who was the first product to be born in America. He was 
supposed to be a she. It was the replacement child after my late sister died. And, uh, but it turned out he has blue eyes and blonde hair, just as my late sister did, except that he's a boy. <laughs> this is the Pesach that I mentioned, our chief rabbi of, um, of Volos during the war, who uh, uh, guided us, unlike uh, uh, Rabbi Koretz, uh, who said, go along and get along and the, and the uh, problem will be overcome. This is the, the uh, adopted son who, uh, of Frosos Stamos. Stamos is the uh, couple, let me see. Oh yes, here it is. This is the couple that saved us uh, during the war. The child is the grandchild of the adopted child, Thanasis. So, and it was the only time I met them in 1970 when I made that uh, fateful flight uh, to Greece and I met my wife and uh, married her and they came to the wedding. So it's a nice, this is my, our eldest uh, granddaughter, Ava Gwen, and these are the, the portraits of the, um, uh, my maternal grandparents and we remember them. Mothers, uh, Sisters and Resisters by uh, Barney um, Gorevovich, uh, who is the editor, uh, was the, uh, a volume on, uh, on women who resisted uh, in their fashion during uh, the Holocaust and includes my own mother's uh, story. On this side, uh, this is the Holocaust Memorial in Volos. This is the formal uh, picture of my parents at their wedding. Here is uh, with Thanasis, the grandson, the, the son of uh, our saviors in front of his uh, uh, country house. This is with uh, Ronald Lauder at the United Nations Holocaust Remembrance. This is my late mother, uh, 95 years old here before she was taken away. And I, we had a wonderful gala event for her. This, uh, this is my father's discharge papers from the Greek army. And these are, this is the, the actual passport, the five of us coming to America. An amazing, amazing, amazing story. Prof, can I ask you, the family that saved you during the Shoah, were they made Hasidah Matalam? Were they made the righteous uh, amongst the Gentiles? That's a very good. Thank you for that question, that lead question. Uh, Abraham Huli uh, is involved in that uh, project uh, with me, uh, along with uh, uh, a woman in, uh, in Castoria, who is uh, a, a Greek non-Jew, who is uh, involved in uh, uh, ferry, ferreting out uh, still Greeks who save and help uh, save Jews. Uh, I am trying to, uh, we did honor them posthumously at the Greek uh, community of Volos, the Jewish community. We gave them a plaque, uh, etc. But I want to do the next step, yes. So we are in the, in the process of uh, doing that. Uh, there, there is a section in Yad Vashem dedicated to uh, Greek Gentiles who, who help Jews, uh, but it's very few. So we can replenish, we can easily find more and we would like to, to do that. So, but very interesting that you should mention this. Uh, I learned that only late, years later because I used to pester my parents, why would they do something like this, knowing that they are they were simple folk, um, uh, very uh, prone to superstition, you know, they, they not much of education, and they would de deflect me time and again. Finally, one day, my father said, "Come here, son. I'll sit down. I'll tell you." Actually, with my mother. They had made, an, they were childless. They never could have children. 
So they came to my parents and said, Yako, Nina, Nina, Sarah, and was known as Nina because she, it was too obvious to call her Sarah. Um, supposing you do not make it through the Holocaust, but Asher survives, do you agree a priori that A, he will never know his background, his origin, he will be baptized, and he will, uh, we even have uh, our name, a name for him, Apostolos, the Apostle, because they deeply thought they were saving a life for their Savior. My parents were uh, amazed. They said, well, what are you talking about? But they kept pressing them. All right, okay, let my son, our son live and you can have him. Well, we survive intact. Don't you think they would come back to haunt them and say, look, you're a young couple, you're going to have more children. Why don't you leave Asher with us? Be assured that he will have everything. He will be our heir and they were very wealthy. And of course, said no. And their relationship was estranged for a long time until she came, the, the woman involved, came to her and said, look, we can go to the Metropolitan, the, the high cleric there, to decide. My mother said, okay, you know, in exasperation. Uh, and again, the wise man of the cloth, he sat down and said, Madam, you live here. The Marathias uh, family lives there. It's all right with you if they see their son almost daily parading around without interacting with them? No, give that boy back to <laughs> to his parents. <laughs> Simple. And that's how it is. And that's how it was. Years later, when I met Thanasi, and he took me very proudly around his, his lands and his uh, livestock and his uh, uh, automobiles, etc., cetera, uh, to impress me, I stopped him, called one morning, and I said, Thanasi, just think, half of this would have been mine had life worked out differently. He looked at me, he smiled, and he said, yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> so it's amazing what religion, what faith can make people do. Super human things. No wonder, you know, we hear about the Muslims and the Shiites and the Sunnis, etc. I mean, passion for religion is very strong. Yes, I have uh, Asher. Uh, what uh, I have a question? No, no, uh, no. Sorry, no. Before I, I have to leave, so I'm still going to keep on recording. But I just want to thank you, and I want to thank you, Prof, for the most incredible, incredible, and very moving and so so heartwarming your presentation tonight. And I'll, I'm going to hand it over to you. Right. You can say the final remark. Yes, so, of course. At thank nine o'clock. Very, very much. Uh, mm. Ah, sure. Uh, in the movie Z by Costa Gavros, the uh, character, the hero, is played by Yves Montan, forgive my pronunciation, who yes, yes. Is a Jew was a Jewish actor, wasn't he? I, that, let me check that while you're... you're I don't think so, that, but uh, he, it is appealing to uh, think so. <laughs> let me check. I know that uh, the uh, socialist uh, Melina Mercuri was was married to uh, Jews, the son. Yeah, he is, he, he is a Jew. His name was uh, Yves Montand, uh, was born in Italy. Uh, I know. Uh, his name was Evo Levy. Montand was born Jew. Yeah. Wait a minute, I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing, let me take this back. It's not clear. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I had hoped he would be. But what about, uh, doesn't Greece have a uh, Greeks-Israel Friendship Society and Chamber of Commerce? Yes. They are certainly 
is someone in Greece who's pro-Jewish and pro-Israel. Right. They exist. But from what you say, they are very much a minority opinion, a view, yeah. is that? And at the governmental level, you know, again, uh, the higher you go in society, the more uh, accepting and uh, interacting with the Jews they, they are. I'm talking about Ipoli, you know, the, the people down below uh, the, that does not uh, penetrate. They go to church uh, and they hear sermons uh, and I monitor them uh, during the uh, Holy Week that just passed and there are references time and again to, to the perfidious Jews. Judeos, Judeos, Judeos. I said, Eleos, mercy, stop. Uh, so, many of them, of course, uh, uh, have uh, lapsed. They, they do not go to church or they are not uh, very ardent Christians, but for the population in general. And they couch it, of course, with the anti, uh, 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 with such tropes as uh, globalism and, uh, and uh, Soros and Rothschilds and, uh, and immigrants, pro immigrants and pro. Uh, uh, refugees, you know, so th there are ways to uh, uh, vent their anti feelings without being overly anti Semitic in their expressions. But th we know what they mean when why, why Soros the center of so many of their angst? I don't know. Can I make a few comments? Yitzhak, good to see you. Yeah, I, I was in my car and then I had a low battery and finally I'm at home. <laughs> so, 300 uh, stevedores were selected by Abba Hushi, who is the head of the Istadrut, the labor union in uh, Haifa. At the beginning, they were exploited, actually. They, uh, they actually had to work seven days a week and were paid low wages. Today, they're actually, some of them are <laughs> evil guys who, are, who make a fortune and like... Uh, don't like get rid of the union guys, but that's, but in short, they, they made the poor Jewish. And then in the 36 riots, uh, they moved to Tel Aviv and they uh, made a Jewish port in uh, Tel Aviv because the Arabs from Yafo boycotted, boycotted the Jewish issue. So Tsur, Tsur Moshe was just a small thing. Yes. Jews from Castoria, Bulgaria, a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's a significant thing. There, there were four Jewish uh, Moshavim from Greece in in Israel, uh, but Surah Moshe is the first one. It's it's for sure the most successful. One. Oh, I but, see. I, I would like to know about the others. Yeah, the, uh, well, there's another one. Called, the last one is called Do Dor. Uh -huh. or it's the second to last. It's this, they have a, a popular beach. They were fishermen, mostly from Arta and Romaniot. Um, there, there was a younger group who were about 15, 16 that, when they were in the mountains. They live at a moshav called Neve Yamin. And there's a moshav named after Henry Morgenthau called uh, Tal Shachar. There, I think there's only like two families left. That's near where I live in the Judean Hills. Um, there was a group of kibbutzniks from Salonika and Athens at Kibbutz Givad Brenner. But most of the Jews were uh, urbanites. They were, they, and they leaned to the right. So they were the general Zionists or revisionists. Tzor, Hadassah, uh, Tzor Moshe stuck out. There was a confrontation once. They invited the Salonikans from Tel Aviv to come uh, for uh, a celebration. And they hoisted the red flag, you know, the labor movement communist red flag. And, and there was a confrontation between the petty bourgeois of Tel Aviv and, uh, and the socialists, and there was mutual spatting. But uh, that's, uh, today, Tzor Moshe, though, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very um, affluent bedroom community. They, they have, what's rare, they have a lot of commemoration. Each house of a founder has a plaque outside and a, a blurb about who they were with their pictures. They made a little museum. They're pretty, the problem is they're like kibbutz people. They're, they're very privy. Yes. So like, for example, at the inauguration, they didn't allow anyone else to come except for one of the Karasos who gave the money and no public. 
I still haven't seen the museum. But um, Carrasco is, an, is another of the many, of the several distinguished families in the Safari Temple uh, in Syria. Right, so, yeah. Zakaria, Hazen, um, Carrasco were uh, Casuto, Casuto, there's a Casuto. Yeah, Carrasco, Carrasco, they're uh, insurance people and they're silent investors of Bank Discount and the Reconati family. But, um, so no, Carrasco is a popular Sephardic name, as you know. Um, but uh, about the righteous Gentiles, in a way, it's too bad you waited, but it's never too late. Yad Vashem has been, is very problematic. I nominated about 2,000 righteous Gentiles in total from all over the world. And in recent years, it's much more harder. They're much, whatever, they have a chip on their shoulder that, <laughs> and it's less of a public thing. Uh, I'll give you like an anecdote. Victor Eliezer's father <clears throat> from Agrinion was saved, was, his name was Yitzchak Eliezer. He was saved, he was, in Elas, caught and put in a jail in a Grinion. That's Western Greece. Right. For, for our two friends who don't exactly know what we're talking about. And uh, a woman in prison actually had like uh, bribed the guard and had him smuggled out. Okay. So. What is, I, I'm looking at a, uh, at a map. I think I have the map here. Anyway, so, so, but um, the point is that I, uh, they knew about, Victor learned about the story from me, but I had interviewed his father. And I went to a Grinian about two times for research and to guest speak. And um, you never know the whole story, but they really nitpicked. Now, this, is, this has even been written in books. I wrote about it in an article. In, in you know Greek historical books, they write about how he was rescued and the woman was the the victim. But for Yad Vashem, it was like they said uh, you have to have a, a witness from that time. How are we going to get a witness in the prison? Like that's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. He he was living, he survived, he was rescued out of the prison. You know what what, what the, the facts don't. It, it doesn't really matter. You know. And right. then that's like, he, they, we, were, we really got mad at Yad Vashem for that. Victor couldn't believe it. But no, your story is, you know, it's a, not mundane, but the normal story of someone being rescued in the Pelian Mountains. And uh, there, there were others, who, you know, who were, who were nominated and recognized. You know, it's a big phenomenon. And um, what, what Huli does, and I help him, is... He, re he recommends Jews who rescued other Jews in the Holocaust. He doesn't deal with righteous Gentiles so much. The righteous Gentiles, the whole thing is a privy thing from Yad Vashem. There's a public council. It's very anti-Sephardic, very racist, very skewed. I've never been uh, invited or anyone like me has never been invited. And then uh, it's, it's, but anyway, it's very political and, uh, in a snotty sense. Um, but yeah, so, um, but back to the, back to Greek society, I mean, you said it very well. I hope you'll give us a copy of your paper. You have some valuable things. I didn't know that uh, the Jews, the Jews settled near uh, Volos in 300 BC or something. That's, right. part of, that's a whole of my education. But, um, and, and, and Thessaly, the, which includes, of course, that's the prefecture, of Thessaly and Magnesias, which includes Volos as the largest city, uh, did not become part of Greece until 1880. So 81. It, 1880, 81, yeah. okay, yeah. 80, 81. Yeah, um, just to give you a perspective that uh, they, they're even more backward. Uh, and uh, they have been influenced a lot by the Neakin Ionia, Nea New Society, the people who, who left, uh, Asia Minor after 18, uh, 1920. The Asia Minor refugees, right. Yeah. So they, even, even in they academia. Resented, they resented the, uh, the Jews of Salonika. Right. So I, I write a lot about that. And yeah. a lot of my writings were rejected because very trite, educated 
yes. Jews or Gentiles who were educated, so to say, about Greek history or the Jews of Greece don't realize what the story is. So the, it was a very hostile population. It changed the, the whole um, demography of the city. And they, they were in charge of the 1931 riots. That's when Jews left for Palestine or for France. And in Israel, part well, we talked about this before. You, you, you heard it. But in Israel, part of the skewed historiography is that you talk about the German Jews in the 30s, but the second biggest group were the Salonican and Greek Jews. About 15 to 18,000 of them came in the 1930s. Most, they couldn't get certificates. Most came as tourists and they just stayed. They had a whole network to fool the British. But, um, so, you know, it's between us, uh, these are big issues, but um, it, it's, it's, still, it's still in the shadow. And recently, uh, some of the, the new, the new Holocaust people are at Bar Ilan University. <laughs> For every two Jew, you know, two Jews, three institutes. But the, for every Jew, there's like they have two Holocaust institutes. <laughs> so, so anyway, we we put out a book about Jews who Jewish rescuers in the Holocaust. So I wrote a chapter about 15 pages about Greece and divided it by regions. That was published by Peter Lang in uh, Germany in Bern, Switzerland. So. Um, and I wrote there about Rabbi Kasuto, how he, uh, he, he uh, didn't even reckon with the German commander to come and give the list. He, he really was lucky because he, maybe, you know, he slipped away and maybe they just weren't as strict. But in, in other places, you know, if you didn't flee immediately, you would have been, you know, dead meat. You would have been, uh, you really would have been retributed, uh, jailed, probably uh, hung. Or, or, or shot by, by the German commanders. I mean, those people you didn't play around with. But Casuto, he, he swindled them. I don't know, when I interviewed him, it was early. I didn't know that much. I interviewed him in 1983. Mm -hmm. uh, he talked about it, but he didn't give details and I didn't know what to ask. I didn't ask intelligent questions or research like questions at that time to him about that. But it's a little too bad. But anyway, I, I got the gist of it. Um, but his family actually went to the mountains in a different place. He wasn't like uh, Rabbi Pesach from Volos that sort of uh, took most of the people with him and, and, and led the flock. Yes, he did. Yes, right, he did. right. No, but Kasuta wasn't exactly like that, but, but he, he snubbed, he snided the German commander and fled fast with his family and, and a few other families. So that, that, his family hasn't cooperated fully. His daughters cooperate with me. And, but they have some cousins who know more things. It's like, sort of like I'm taught when I asked them, I emailed them, I called them on the phone. I'm sort of like, I'm talking to the wall. They don't know what I'm talking about. Whoa, 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 whoa. You know, anyway, so there, I, I still think I could get more of a perspective. I think probably, um, what's his name? Sh Elias Shabbatai from, the rabbi in, in Laris, I'm sure he has uh, other things to say. Um, and also... They're in the a, midst of uh, rebuilding their synagogue, of course. Yeah. Yeah. There, there was a, a, a young boy from Tricola. He, he's, he was like a baby like you. He became a rabbi in Paris. I've lost touch with him. His name is um, Capetas, Isaac, Rabbi Isaac Capetas. He retired, he moved to Israel. I haven't had any contact with him in Israel. But for Spielberg, I interviewed him in Greek, in Paris, and he was really tough. But, but he is like a four-year-old. He was probably about one or two, and then they, they had for a lengthy time, not just a year. It was a good two plus years. So anyway, but so there's more of it because so, you know, in every place it was different in Karditsa, where they <laughs> hold up the map <laughs> in Karditsa, they all left in one. Um... I don't know if you can. Or just point to it if you can. Right, it's 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 in Thessaly in that middle section in the middle somewhere. Right. Okay. Asher yeah. can maybe I I can point to it on the screen, but that you won't see it. So 
in, in Karditsa, the community most left the, all together and they stayed mostly in one village. Yeah. There were, what, about 80 people? You can't do that if you're like hundreds sure, of people. Sure. But. And in uh, Ioannina, maybe 40 and, and elderly, mainly elderly. Right. So you, to before you talked about uh, Rachel Dalvin. So one of the valuable things she did was get the testimonies of Shabtai Kabili, the one who could say betrayed the Jews and believed the Germans. You and me know all the whole story, but but at the end, he not only he did uh, he went along with the Germans, but he demanded that uh, some partisans come back from the mountains, some Jewish partisans, of course. Yes, yes, it did. So, so about 20 did. came back, and yeah. some of those who were caught <clears throat> were in the rebellion in Birkenau in uh, October 1944. So there weren't very many Salonikans in the rebellion in Birkenau because they'd been there longer and they were already taken out to be executed after three three uh, three months so there, there was a few but most of them were from either they were caught in the partisans in attica near above athens for all of you know or or those in western greece you know people like from preveza or arta in the in the, where those greek romanio jews were in north western greece so those people they already knew they had a sense of what was happening so they didn't believe Kabili, but they were caught. But so when they got to Auschwitz, it's like, uh, they're a tough bunch. So they're, they're the bunch that revolted in crematorium four. They beat eight German guards. They put the mattresses on fire. They destroyed that crematorium. They ran to crematorium number three which was like a sprint of, I'm not sure exactly, I would say about 200, 300 meters, but they were in the heat of the you know, moment. And then in crematorium number three with others, they, they whomped on the uh, German guards, but the Germans came to attack them from the outside. So what's important here, and obviously we're not a lot of people, but this is part of the preservation of this Zoom or whatever this will be, this YouTube is that they sang one verse of the Greek, of the, they sang a short song from the Greek partisans and they sang one verse of the long Greek national anthem. And then, but those were mostly Romania Jews from Western Greece. Mm -hmm. And then someone named Yitz, Yitz, not Yosef Baruch, Yitzchak Baruch from Salonika put the bomb in the furnace which blew up crematorium three. And then the German guards came and killed them all. So for years, I've tried, I've toiled and I've tried to have that put in the, in Auschwitz, for example. And then, no, it's like, it's not, it's, it's like Pasnisch. It's like, forget it. It's like, uh, we, don't, we can't relate. That's not what we know. And we're not going to change anything. But, but it's these Romanio Jews, you know, that have the same fighting spirit that you do, et cetera, and you, they didn't make it. You, you were younger, you, you survived. But um, it's part of the tragedy. But, you know, we, we now we remember Romanio Jews. We have a museum on Broom Street. And, yeah, right. <laughs> and whatever. Okay, I've said what I wanted to say. It's Very good. It was very nice. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yitzhak. Uh, just an observation that... Uh, Many uh, Jews uh, did go uh, to uh, to fight in the resistance with the communists, uh, believing in the um, in the God that eventually fell uh, the the world. You know, the, many people were taken during the 30s and the depression with the idea of uh, communism as being the uh, the promise for the future. Uh, likewise, uh, Greek Jews, a few of them, including. <clears throat> I must say, <clears throat> my own uh, uncle, uncle, uh, my my uh, my brother's uh, uh, sister's husband, Baruch Cohen, who uh, 
whose children are now dotting all over uh, Israel and uh, roads. But uh, uh, when we came to America, I used to pass to my parents, I said, why can't we um, uh, do something for the Cohen family? They had six children at the time uh, to come to America as, and we can sponsor them. And I learned the sad thing, keep in mind, this is the 50s, this is uh, uh, the hysteria of McCarthyism. It turned out that um, he did apply to come to America, but he was rejected outright because mm. of his, his affiliation with the communists during the, uh, during mm. the war. Uh, they did not trust such applicants, so they turned to Israel. Uh, likewise, uh, not, uh, not the communists, not the ide ideological uh, dimension, but just uh, where to go after the war. My, my brother's younger brother, uh, my father's younger brother, Moshe, <coughs> was single and braved the, uh, the embargo and the, uh, uh, the, the uh, British embargo uh, on, uh, on Jewish immigration and found himself in Holon, single at the time, eventually married a Bulgarian Jew uh, and settled with the promise, this is pre-war, pre-48 uh, Palestine, uh, Yaakov, wait for me to give you the signal when to come to Israel because you have a family to raise and life in Israel is very, very, very difficult. Well, that flag never ho was never hoisted. So we, but for the grace of God, I would have made my future wife, even now she would be happy tomorrow to fly and live in Israel. But because of the earthquakes, it was America who came to the rescue and said, look, we did not do enough to save Greek Jews during the Holocaust, and, but now we're in a position to, to help you. Do you want us to give you aid to rebuild your business and home? Or do you want to come to America waiving the hated quota system that was in existence? My father did not hesitate in his mid thirties then. Can you imagine starting all over in a new country with a new language? I mean, he spoke before dying, he spoke six or seven languages but English was not then one of them. And uh, he came. So who knows? Okay, I, I have a surprise for you. I've never told you this. <laughs> you have a, well, you are Matatias. They were Matatiao, but let's just say it's the same thing. Right, it is. The they're, they're, but they, they were from Corfu, this family. I'm not sure when they made Aliyah. I don't remember anymore. But the father, uh, under the guise of being a Greek Gentile businessman in Amman, <laughs> okay, as an Israeli, but not that legal, legally at all as an Israeli under this assumed identity, he was the Jewish agency's man in Jordan to help pass on and smuggle Jews from Iraq to Israel. Really? Oh. He, they, they lived in Amman because I knew his son. And they live in Amman for a few years, and he was caught. The Jordanians hanged him, hung him. So the story has never been written about. It's always like this, someone else knew the story, like someone who's not a historian, some guy who was a physicist. And then Israel didn't want him to reveal the details. I tried to, but it, ne it never happened. But I know, I, I know uh, the son I haven't been, I've been in touch with for many years, but not regularly, but you know, he's still around. Anyway, but uh, that's, that's an, another unusual story, but uh, I don't know his, I think he had a Holocaust story too, but something different anyway, but because it's even rarer that someone from Corfu survived in the Holocaust and hid, et cetera, et cetera. But they're just, it's your namesake, so. Uh, yes, yes. I had to come to America to learn <clears throat> about Jewish history, about being a Jew, frankly. Uh, there were no Jewish uh, rabbis or, uh, 
or teach us to uh, educate us after the war. So, uh, you know, it's amazing. And yes, uh, also about the Ashkenazim, uh, as far as we knew, there were the Romagnots and there were the Sephardim uh, arriving in, uh, in uh, that uh, uh, very snowy morning, cold. Uh, the uh, the uh, highest people and the uh, joint distribution people uh, query us and said, are you Jewish? Yes, do you speak Jewish? What are you talking about? My father said, do you speak Ladino? Don't you speak Yiddish? What's Yiddish? You know, this is- he didn't, know, he didn't know what Yiddish yes. was and they didn't know what uh, Ladino was. That's yes. a, can you uh, imagine? Ash Asher and Yitzchak, we have to conclude the program soon. <laughs> and you. I want to add, which I think you, Asher, know, and I don't think Yitzchak knows that in the four years that we lived on New York's Lower East Side, we attended Kilat Kedoshe Yananan oh, Broom Street. Oh, nice. Both our girls are named there. And I always liked when we went for Rosh Hashanah, the prayers with Ladino Romaniot in Hebrew. Right. Yeah. And now, since last summer, they have on permanent display a piece of artwork by my mother, who just turned 91. She's a stained oh. glass artist. And it's what's, there. What's her name? What's her Sarah name? Gallen, when you walk in the door mm -hmm. and up the stairs, there okay. is artwork by my mother. I have to find it and send it to you, a picture yes, of it, please. on please. permanent display there now. And I remember very well Hyman Jenny, who I kept, Jenny, yeah, yeah. kept yeah. the community going. Great guy. And now Marvin and others. Uh, Marcus. Ma Marvin, Marvin Marcus turned it. I was there with my mother when the piece was installed in July 2000. No, June 2019. Oh, very recently, there. wow. Right, or was that in 2020? I have to check, that was last year. You know, you know my address, 10 minutes away from Kennedy Airport, the next I, time you come. Thank you very Wonderful. much. <laughs> and uh, mm, uh, there at Kiddush, so we had instead of schmaltz, herring, and schnapps was uzu and feta cheese and olives. And most Israelis are surprised when I, they say, Iraq, I said, oh, you mean Uzu? And they say, well, oh. how do you know that? That it's called <laughs> Uzu, because I said, that's what we drank at Broom Street on Shabbat. And then- Hard boy legs, the hard mm -hmm. boy leg. Yes, a yeah. very moving story of how the community from Monastir came together yes. with the community of Yanina, because by the time we got there, most of the people had gone to Alam Haba, the suburbs, so they didn't have enough for their own congregations or daily prayers. They gathered together on Shabbat, and again, that's why the prayers were Ladino, Romaniot, and Hebrew. So uh, we still have the certificates from when our girls who were one and two and a half Beautiful. were named there. And I have a lot of photos, and I, gee, I really have to see. Well, what, what years did you live there in the Lower East? 1988 side? until 1992. First uh -huh. as a subleasing, and then we got into the co-ops, and we ended up having our own apartment in the amalgamated dwellings, which is the, the buildings, the oldest building, 1929, based on workers' housing, model workings housing from Holland. I think that's landmark now, too. That's when we were there. What else did I want to say or ask, ask you? It's a little bit late now because we have to conclude the program, but I would have liked to ask you about the German soldier who saved your family's life when they found yes, you in the cave. Yes. So you know what? Let's go a little bit longer uh, so you can tell that story because oh, there's, so, there's so few good stories to tell compared yes. to the bad ones that we should hear them. And it is... Uh, absolutely the reason why to this day I cannot hate Germany uh, or despise uh, its people or avoid visiting or boycotting its products. Um, uh, what, uh, what happened was uh, that my father during daylight hours would try to do some work outside the, uh, the primitive uh, surroundings that uh, were called home in Ayos Lavrendios. It's one of the 24 villages that dot Pilion, the mount. And uh, 
uh, so uh, it was my my mother and myself, uh, a baby, and uh, while there were patrols uh, uh, roaming around uh, the the hills, because when they made the similar demand that um, that all Jews or Bolos show up in the uh, in the port, in the platea there the square, uh, the way they did in Liberty Square in Salonica, uh, only a fraction showed up, the infirm and the elderly, because so many heard what happened to their religionists in Salonica and vanished in the, in the hills. Uh, so they began to comb the hills too, and many were located, many Jews were located and brought to task. Um, occasionally, by the wails, by the cries of their own babies. This is unbelievable, unbelievable. And some babies' uh, mouths were stuffed while the patrol passed only to discover that the uh, baby had expired in the meantime. I mean, a, a dreadful uh, situation in any event. So uh, I must have been a beautiful baby, but look at me now. Uh, I like to say because uh, there came a day, a morning, when a uh, German patrol actually located us. Anything could have happened. I mean, they could have separated us, uh, shot us, uh, deported us, nothing. The head of the patrol passes the uh, makeshift grip, looks down, and that moment, a vision of his own son he left behind in Hamburg came to him and might have made him soften his gaze. The next word out of his mouth, my mother would tell me, was rouse. She did not understand. It was out, never to bother us again. I mean, this is inexplicable given the situation and the mortal danger the Jews uh, were facing. So, you know, uh, the couple of times that I found myself in, uh, in Germany, I sought out people of a certain age to ask two things. Where were you and what did you do during the war? You'd be surprised how many people still would deflect and deny, oh, well, we did not know what was happening. All right, I, want to I feel better making them uncomfortable. And as far as uh, buying, uh, uh, am I going, I drive occasionally a, a Mercedes or a BMW, am I going to deny the refugees or the immigrants who constructed that in, in, a, in German uh, uh, factories, their bread and butter? No, 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 no. And it has made me a more accepting and not necessarily excusing their content, but accepting uh, of human frailty, you know, and being able to move on, to, to, to move, that's all. And, um, and then I tell also the uh, a postscript, a few years back, all of a sudden, I get my bank statement and I see $6,000, which I did not deposit. I called the, my, uh, my banker, said, Professor, it was an electronically wired. From where? From the claims conference. Since then, periodically, every six weeks or so, uh, a fraction of that uh, enters. I was mystified because uh, for all the years that my, life, my, my parents were alive, they refused to take anything, any compensation mm -hmm. from Germany. Uh, when I asked the claims uh, representative, he said, Professor, you were not directly in the concentration camps. You were not directly impacted like that. But now we are in position to give aid and comfort to a second tier of sufferers. And we deem you to have suffered for the eight months or so that you lived in, a, in that primitive cave. Originally, they didn't give to under 15, but once, is it, is once that so? those kids are the only ones living, about 10 years ago, they started to give to kids also. So now we'll have to conclude 
this program, uh, there's so much to talk. Asher, could there's a noise in the background? Could as a radio or TV or something? No, it's the telephone that I keep uh, turning off. Oh, okay. so much to talk about. I had wanted to ask you perhaps another time about Aaron Castro, who's still alive, I think, who founded the Castro clothing line in Israel, who uh, I looked up while you were talking this from uh, Thessalonica, Thess Thessaloniki. I don't know how to pronounce it. Anyway, he came to Israel and he created one of the world's, from nothing, from one little store like Sai Sins. This is a wonderful success story and I hope we'll have a chance to, okay. in the future program, have him on the show with us together. And Yitzchak, uh, I'd like to say now that Dr. Yitzchak Karam has a program coming up. Let me see, it's in, uh, in July and August. Let me just check that. He has a program coming up on, yes, Israeli mass radiation experiments on Spartak and Mizrahi school children in the 1950s Wow! with uh, Professor Rafi Shubeli. See, one of the things I'm glad with our lecture series is, this is one of the reasons I neither accept nor solicit donations for the Root and Branch Association. Uh, he who has the gold rules, that's the golden rule. And no one can tell me on Friday not to come back on Monday. And it is a real New York State not-for-profit corporation. It does have US federal tax exempt status but I'm very glad we don't need to use it. There are only two board members left, myself and Rabbi Yehoshua Friedman. And because I built it up on my own, we don't even, we're very happy to have it hosted at the Israel Center, which was very good to us for 25 years. In very rare cases, they say, look, there's a problem for us to have so-and-so speak here. That doesn't even apply anymore because now I do it through Zoom. And if YouTube didn't like any of our programming in the future, it doesn't bother me. There are other platforms such as BitChute and Rumble and more coming online. So we can have any programming we want. And I'm very glad for that fact. And as long as I'm alive, we'll continue to do so. So we have that upcoming program. Looking forward to future programs with you. And now I have to conclude because Les, Les had to go to a family Zoom gathering. I want to thank uh, you, our speaker, and Dr. Karam for participating, <laughs> and Les for being with us as program you. chair, and our uh, viewers and listeners who will see this on YouTube and the various platforms, about 10 of them now, where we share the programs. Again, I want to remind our viewers and listeners, I always remind at the beginning what I said at the, at the end, what I said at the beginning, that the, today is... Thursday, May 6, 2021, the Gregorian calendar. Now that the sun is set, it's now the 25th of ER 5781 in the Hebrew Israelite calendar. I want to wish our viewers and listeners a Shabbat Shalom and a good weekend. As, as much as possible when we have basically a month of mourning for a mass tragedy in Moron. And again, there I would say with uh, John Donne in his famous poem, The Bell Tolls for Thee. I keep that in mind that we should all view those who died, whatever the circumstances were, as uh, members of our own family. The bell. Do not ask for who the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. So on that note, again, Shabbat Shalom to Shabbat shalom. everyone. Shabbat Shalom. And Thank looking you. forward to our next program. Good night. Bye.